Good afternoon, Grandview. It is good to see you. After having a week off from Wednesday in the Word, it's good to be back in the groove and rocking and rolling. I hope you have had a good week so far, and uh, you got to love this uh, bipolar weather here in Iowa. Hot one day, cold the next. Uh, but hey, it is a day that God has given us. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. I wanted to go ahead and tell you, I'm going to skip all the announcements today, but there are announcements down in the comments. So if you'd like to look at those, feel free. Uh, I want to spend most of our time today diving into the Word together. So we're going to be in Hosea chapter 8 today, and I want to open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into it. Father God, we thank you for uh, loving us today. God, we thank you, Father, for uh, the goodness you continue to provide for us, God, for sunshine, for rain. Father, you provide all these things, and we're thankful for those things. God, we thank you, though, most of all, that you give us Jesus. That you sent someone to save us from ourselves, to save us from our sin. And God, we thank you for that. God, we pray today as we study your word together that you would use it to enlighten us, to enrich us, God, and to motivate us to move to holiness. Father, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, as we get diving into chapter 8, maybe you don't recall, maybe your first time uh, with us here on Wednesday in the Word, I want to kind of give you some catch up, okay? Uh, you've got the first uh, seven chapters of the book of Hosea all stem on one real big premise, that God's people have been unfaithful. Hey, the story starts in chapter 1 where God tells Hosea to go marry a woman who's a prostitute. And in that midst, God is showing the people of Israel how they had been unfaithful. Because what happened was Hosea married this woman, Gomer, knowing she was going to be unfaithful. And what we understand is that God knows at times that we're going, He knows all the times that we're going to be unfaithful. But the reality is God knows that we're going to make mistakes. And what this is, is this is a pointed uh, conversation for us to see God's desire and design for us to, to walk in holiness. And so today we're going to read chapter 8. I've got some notes for you, some great, uh, some great knowledge that I want to have you put into application in your day life, uh, and then we will uh, just celebrate the good things of God. Amen? All right, so here we go. It says, Hosea chapter 8, verse 1. It says, Set the trumpet to your lips. One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. To me they cry, My God, we Israel know you. Israel has spurned the good, the enemy shall pursue them. Now, we're going to take this in our normal kind of fashion. We'll break it down in a few verses at a time. Uh, what we see in this today is, is this powerful uh, analogy that God put, gives here. It starts with this phrase where he's t telling uh, Hosea. He says, set the trumpet to your lips. Uh, what this trumpet is, it's called the shofar. And what the shofar is, is it's a, it's a horn that's shaped uh, trumpet that's shaped like a like a ram's horn. And what they would do is they would blow into that when an enemy was coming, when someone was approaching, when they were going to be attacked as a sign of warning. And so what would happen is he was telling them, he was saying, this is your warning. What I love about how God handles all of these things is God always warns us. Just like a parent who tells a kid, if you do that again, this is going to happen. God warned them, if you disobey me, these things are going to happen. And as that continues to happen, what we see is God is not just punishing them without fair warning. And so God says uh, to Hosea, set your, trumpet to the, uh, to set your lips to the trumpet. Sorry. He says, this is uh, coming. You need to be prepared. Tell them that the judgment is coming on them. And then you have this crazy analogy here. It says, one like a vulture is over the house of the Lord. This is a, a, a very strange analogy because a vulture is a scavenger bird, right? A, a vulture is the one that picks the, picks the meat off the bones of a dead animal. And what you're hearing here is God is comparing Israel to an animal that's already died. He said, you know what? You've gone so far away from me. You've severed the relationship. You've severed what gives you life. When we remember that God gives us life, he says, you've severed that relationship. And what he says is that these, these animals, this vulture will come and attack them. He'll attack what's already dead. He'll rip from the bones what's left. And this is a, a crazy analogy, I think, that, that God is telling people of Israel, look, you were my people, but because you don't listen, you're dead. You're spiritually dying. And then, and then the response of Israel in verse 2 is one that is, is absolutely absurd. It says, to me they cry, my God, we Israel know you. And what has happened here is that God says, you're, you're at 
actions show that you don't know me. Your words may say that, but your actions have done everything but that. What we see is that they claim to acknowledge God. See, this is called lip service, right? To say something, but to not mean something. And God is saying, look, they say they know me, but they have no clue who I am. They're far from me. They don't have an iota of who I am. And so as we see that, that God is, is, is re, re, oh, I'm having a hard time talking. God is reprimanding them. Because what we see here in verse 3, he says, Israel has spurned the good. The enemy shall pursue them. God is saying to them, look, you've rejected the law I gave you. See, one thing we miss with the law is we look at the law and we go, oh man, the law is harsh. Oh, the law is bad. Look, the law was designed to protect, right? The law that God gave was designed to protect. It also is a source that tells us, hey, we violated the law, therefore we need grace. See, the law was not evil. And we've missed that. We've taken the Old Testament law and we've gone, oh, that's so hard. That's so bad. No, it's God's attempt to protect them. And God set up that for them moral and ethical standards and they violated them. And because they violated them, they would fall under attack. See, what we have to understand is this attack they're facing is not just the, from the enemy. It is from God judging them. We don't like that aspect. We can't stand it, but it's God bringing judgment upon them. Verse 4. I want to read verses 4 through verse 6 because that portion runs together. It said, They made kings, but not through me. They set up princes, but I knew it not. With their silver and gold, they made idols for their own destruction. I have spurned your calf, O Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? For it is from Israel a craftsman made it. It's not God. The calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. Okay, we're going to focus on verse 4 for just a moment, okay? And then we'll, we'll of course, get the highlights of everything else. In verse 4, it says this, that they made kings, but not through me, okay? They set up princes, but I knew them not. I need to to explain this to you. This does not mean that God did not know them, okay? This does not mean that God did not have knowledge of who they were, that God did not allow them to take control or take power. What this means is they didn't ask God. So you have to remember all the way back to when uh, Israel first begged for a king. Uh, They had been told, you're not going to get a king. The only king you need is God. And they saw everybody else around them getting kings. And they were like, well, we want one. And so they copied all the other nations and and begged God, saying, would you please just give us a king? And God gave them Saul. We know how that went. Not well for them. And so what we see is that they began to install kings without even asking God what he wanted. See, we know that God allows people into authority. God gives people authority. I mean, Hebrews 13.1 tells us that nobody who's ever been in government authority has that position without God allowing it or giving it to them. See, God allowed them to do this thing as a, really as a test to see if they would rely on him. Would they trust him? Would they turn to him? Or would they just do things the way they want to? They would sell the role of leader for whoever would protect them. And so we see this happening all throughout. Remember, this is why they made treaties with other countries to be protected instead of relying on God. And then the last part of that verse is quite interesting. It says, with their silver and gold, they made idols for their own destruction. See, the biggest part of the spiritual adultery that was happening was idol worship. And God said, they, they took the riches I've given them and they brought about their own destruction. This wasn't God destru- destroying them. This, they had destroyed themselves. See, this is taking ownership and accountability for our actions. Is that this is a, one of the biggest problems. I see it. I see it all the time uh, in adults. I see it all the time in children. They want to blame somebody else. And what happened is that Israel is going, oh, no, woe is me. Why are we suffering? Because you did these things. Because you brought upon uh, this, this punishment because you committed spiritual adultery. And then verse 5 says, I have spurned your calf. What an interesting thing that it says here. It says, I've spurned your calf. See, the Lord rejected. They had made this calf idol. They would made this idol that looked like a cow. Now, this sounds absurd uh, to you and I. Why would you worship a cow? We'd rather eat one, right? Uh, what we see is this is a, a pattern in the life of Israel. All the way back to the days when they were in Egypt, what we saw in Egypt, there was a ton of worshiping of animals, specifically cattle. 
a cattle, bull. Uh, they worshiped all these things. And so what we see is they really carried some of this baggage from their time in Egypt. And of course, the other lands they went to also worshiped other types of cows and animals. And so what we see here is God saying, you spurned me. You spurned me, so I'm spurning you. And they spurned God for a cow. This puts us all the way into Romans where it says that people had given up on the Creator and worshipped the creation. And because of that, God was angry with them. And he asked this question, verse 5, how long will you be incapable of innocence? He's asking, how long can you keep doing wrong? You know, you think there's eventually a point where somebody learns their lesson. I, I know we think that all the time. That how much longer does this person have to suffer before they realize that their actions are causing their problems? This is what God's saying. He's saying to the people, how long do you have to keep suffering before you recognize that the problems you're facing are your own doing? And then verse 6. I love how God does this. God says to them, uh, for it is from Israel a craftsman made it. It is not God. He's saying, how dumb, and I, I'm, I hate to belittle anybody, but listen to what he says. He says, how dumb are you? This was made by a person. This was made by human hands, and you worship it. And we go, okay, well, wow, Israel, you're you're not very smart. You are worshiping, uh, you are worshiping cows, little golden cows made by people. And then I sit here and go, sometimes we worship little brown ovals that get thrown from person to person, and. We worship sports, or we worship uh, the dollar bill, or we worship uh, fashion, or our cars, or our homes, or even our own bodies. See, God's saying those things aren't God. He is. How could we so, so bring ourselves to so low that we would worship a cow instead of worshiping the creator of the cow? And God says, is, you know what? Punishment's coming, and I'm going to break it. I'm going to smash. I'm going to smash the idols. But why were they so drawn to these idols? That's a great question, and I know you're asking that, right? Why are they so drawn to these idols? Well, part of it was a ritual. Part of it was the fact that it was just something they did over and over and over. It became a ritual that made them feel like they were accomplishing something. Uh, I had a conversation years ago with a, with a meth addict who actually would say that the process of, of doing the meth was not the part they enjoyed, but the ritual of getting it prepared. And see, sometimes we find, find peace in ritual, right? Sometimes we find peace in doing something over and over and over again. What we have to recognize is that God doesn't desire us to continue to do rituals. He, continue, he desires for us to continue to do right and to do it out of love. God's desire is not uh, for us to sacrifice, but for us to obey. What's interesting is that we're doing these uh, rituals, and I, and I read this quote earlier, and I thought it was great. They were doing these rituals in an attempt to conceal inward death by an outward show. It was like putting on an elaborately dressed up corpse in the middle of a living organism, and all I could think of was the old TV, uh, old movie, Weekend at Bernie's. If you haven't seen it, Bernie dies. They carry him around like he's alive the whole time. They even made two movies. Terrible idea. But we got to see you can't fake faith. You can't fake faith in order to make the world think everything is okay. True faith makes things right because you know who's in control. I got to keep going. I got to keep going here. Uh, verse 7 says this. Uh, for they sow the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. The standing grain has no heads, it shall yield no flower. If it were to yield, strangers would devour it. Israel is swallowed up. Already they are among the nations a useless vessel. Hear those words that God uses. He says, you are a useless vessel, Israel. For they have gone to Assyria, a wild donkey, a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has hired lovers. Though they hire allies among the nations, I will soon gather them up, and the kings and princes shall soon rive because of the tribute. Listen, this, this is intense, okay? Uh, what God says in verse 7, You sow the wind. 
in in the, the ancient Israel world, the idea of the wind was that it was something foolish and it was worthless because it never kept its pattern. It would blow one way and blow the next. And what we see is that they're saying, God is saying to them, you sow wind, you sow silliness, you sow folly, and what you're going to reap is destruction because of your folly. You think about this is the wind you you don't see you don't see the wind you of course see the products of the wind so what we see is that god is bringing about this idea he says you're going to face a punishment that is massive you're going to face a punishment that is massive and he says and even if you did sow grain i'm gonna let somebody else eat it what he's saying is although you may have you may have done a little good, you may have sown a little good, your evil was so outnumbered it that you're gonna reap what you sow. I mean, this is a principle we see all throughout scripture, is it not? Uh, Paul says, You will reap what you sow. God will not be mocked. If you sow evil, you're gonna reap evil. If you sow idolatry, you're gonna reap idolatry. And what we see is this God is telling them, You haven't fooled me. God is saying, you haven't fooled me. You're going to reap what you sow. Verse 8, when it says, Israel has swallowed up uh, already among you, you're just a useless vessel. What was the purpose for the people of Israel? They were there to glorify God and to make, make him known. They were there to, to be his people and to make him known to the other nations. And instead, they took on the identity of every other nation. Instead of bringing the identity of God to to everyone else, they always took on everybody else's identity. See, this is a danger within the church. The church at times has a, a, a habit of saying, hey, let's look like the world so we can so we can lure people in. See, the beauty of the of being a Christ follower is that you don't want to be like the world. And if we're doing it right, the world wants to be like us. And so we see that coming through here in this, in this message. And what we catch further into this in verse 9, God just wallops them. Okay? And he says, For they have gone up to Assyria, a wild donkey wandering alone. Now look, I absolutely find this hilarious. What God says to them is he says, You're following a wild donkey. Now donkeys are stubborn. Donkeys are careless donkeys are just hard to control and we know there's a slang term for a donkey and that's actually the terminology used here uh and he says they've they've gone from following me to following this wild donkey Uh, god god is fed up he's fed up with the choices they make And and i have to believe at times god's fed up with the choices that we make because we make choices at times that just are bonehead choices to follow one thought or to follow another instead of following him. To follow our own desires and, and instead of trusting his plan. But then he says this thing here at the end of verse 9, which is an extremely uh, delicate thing he says here. Ephraim has hired lovers. Now you have to understand this. One of the things that God has said all throughout this book is that his people... That his people have been spiritual prostitutes. He's called them spiritual harlots all throughout the time, which means they have sold themselves to others. That they've given themselves to others for gain. And what we see here in verse 9 is this. He says, Ephraim has hired lovers. What what this literally means is that Ephraim the the harlot, Ephraim, Ephraim the prostitute, has actually paid others to prostitute them. Now that sounds like a really weird thing, but what we see is this, is he is saying to them, look, they have given themselves away and paid people to take them. That's not how that relationship's supposed to work. It's dangerous. The note I have here says, Ephraim, who had played the harlot, had done something even worse, and they had paid others to love them rather than receiving the love that God had promised them from the very beginning. See, this is the great thing is God has promised to love us. For those of us that follow him, he's promised us to, he said, I will love you. You're my people. You're my God. I'm your God. I'm I'm here with you. And they just, they don't stay with him. They run away from him. 
and choose other things. In verse 10 continues this kind of concept of what he says. He says, though they hire allies among the nations, I will soon gather them up. And the king and the princes shall writhe because of the tribute. He's saying, you know what, they've hired other countries to protect them, but that will not last. They will not protect them. I am the king, and I will charge the highest price. Man, this is is where God's wrath is really starting to pour out on his people. He said, I'm done letting you be protected by other people. You're mine, and I'm going to protect you, but first you've got to pay the price. Man. Man. That's a hard one. That's a tough one. We see this real quickly, some more spiritual idolatry issues that come up. Verses 11 uh, through 14. Uh, I'll read verse 11, then I'll come back. It says, Because Ephraim has multiplied altars for sinning, they have become to him altars for sinning. Now, let me explain this to you because that can be some kind of wordplay going on there. What we see is this, is that the, they had God had set up for them the altars they're supposed to have. Only so many altars, and God had set them up. He said, this is where you should worship. This is where you'll sacrifice. This is where you give offering. And, and what had happened is Ephraim thought, the people of Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim was like, you know what? If we put more uh, altars out, then, then we can be we can be better, right? We can be more righteous. We can be more holy. If we can put out more, then we'll be great. Well, what happened was the more they did this, the more people saw it as an opportunity to keep sinning. Like, well, if, if there's more altars, then I can just sin and be forgiven more often, right? So what we had is a lack of logic that they were supposed to be used for worship. Instead, they were being used to commit sin. And the way God says this, He says, "You've multiplied the altars of sinning; they've become altars." For sinning. Now people are just like, I'll just sin because I can be forgiven. Oh my goodness. That's exactly what Paul's talking about in Romans. He says, shall we sin so that grace will abound? No, let it never be. And what we saw was the people of Israel were like, hey, I can be forgiven. Let's keep sinning. See, that's not what the Christian life's about. When we follow God, we put to death sin. Instead of saying, well, I can just be forgiven over and over and over. Don't make a mockery of the sacrifice of Christ. Don't make a mockery of the sacrifice that was paid for sin. And that's what the people were doing. They were making a mockery of the sin sacrifice offered to God. And when you make a mockery of that offering, you make a mockery of God. And God was fed up. Now, what's amazing is verse 12. He says this. Were I to write for him my laws by the ten thousands, they would be regarded as a strange thing. See, God had been very specific about his commands, right? There are 613 laws in the Old Testament. It may be 631. Sometimes you get the numbers transposed. But there are 600 and some odd laws in the Old Testament given for God's people. Very specific laws. And God said, if I gave them 10,000, they still couldn't figure it out. God's kind of being ironic here. He said, you know what? I've tried. I've tried to give you these laws. I've tried to help you. But you just look at them like they're foreign. You're like, I don't understand this law. I don't get this. I don't understand why you wouldn't want me to do that. I don't understand why you want me to do that, God. And they, they just didn't get it. And God said, they, they just they don't understand. I've given you rule after rule after rule to help you walk in holiness, and you just keep obliterating them. Verse 13, As for my sacrificial offerings, they sacrifice meat and eat it. But the Lord doesn't accept it. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. What God is saying is this. He said, you know what? That sacrifice you're offering, I just see it as meat. I don't see it as the bloodshed that's mentioned uh, that is a forgiveness for all sins. Blood has to be shed. I don't even see that. It's, I just see because of your lack of genuine love and repentance, all I see is the sacrificed animal. I don't see love, repentance, asking for grace, asking for mercy. I don't see any of those things. He says, and because I don't see that in you, I'm going to punish Now, why is God being so specific about this? You're probably going, okay, pastor, I get it. God's going to punish. What what God is getting to them to the point of this is it's not about the ritual. It's not about the religion. It is about being in love with your creator. Bingo. 
That's what it's about. It's not about all these other follow the rules. Why well, he says, hey, I give you 10,000 rules, you still wouldn't care. He says, because the rules are not what matter the most. Your love for me is what matters the most, because if you love him, you're going to keep his commandments. Jesus said that. And so we get this idea here that God said, you know, you're going to be punished because this isn't done out of love. What, what I want to see, it says, He will now remember their iniquity and punish their sins, and they shall return to Egypt. If you remember back in Exodus, He removed them from Egypt, brought them out of slavery. Uh, the ancient historian Josephus actually writes that some of the Israelites, when they were conquered, when they were conquered, some of them actually were sent to Egypt as slaves. Wow. God fulfilling His word that he would actually punish them by sending them back to be slaves. See, God doesn't look at our sin and think, oh, oh, no big deal. He looks at it in disgust. I want to move on to, to verse 14 real quickly. It says, For Israel has forgotten its maker and built palaces, and Judah has multiplied fortified cities. So I will send fire upon his cities, and it shall devour his strongholds. God's word to his people at this point, he says, you know what? You've forgotten me. You've forgotten your first love. Is that not a challenge we hear in Revelation? Where God says to the church, you've forgotten your first love. God says, you've forgotten me. You've forgotten the one who's blessed you, and you've forgotten the one who's rescued you, the one who broke the bondage of, of slavery. You've forgotten all these things. He says, because of that, I'm going to have to bring fire. I'm going to bring destruction. The thing about fire is fire destroys. And he said, I'm going to devour you. See, they have become not God's people, but they've become a cult. They become a cult who worshiped whatever they wanted to, whatever made them feel good at the moment. Folks, I, don't, I fear that's the world we're in today. Is that people claim Christ but worship whatever they want to. They claim Christ but follow whatever desires they want to of their own hearts. We have to be people who are obedient out of love for our God. Our God who has rescued us and redeemed us. We've got to love Him. Quit choosing the things of this world to love. And love your Creator. That's what He made you for. Hey, I love you folks. I know these messages are hard. They're not easy. Trust me, they're not easy to tell them to you either. But God's Word is good, and His desire is to point us back to holiness and walking with Him. God bless you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.